The spirits of Avatar The Last Airbender were iconic. Evangelion-style pandas, face-stealing giant centipedes, and nerdy owl dragon things that were simply beyond human understanding. They often served as narrative extensions of the natural world and had mysterious, compelling motivations outside the boundaries of good and evil. Truly, they were a breath of fresh air compared to the usual Western understanding of good versus evil that we're all kind of sick of. Which is why it's so frustrating that Legend of Korra, despite wanting to tell more stories about the spirits, doesn't seem to understand why the spirits in the original series work to begin with. Instead of being complex, nuanced, totally amoral entities, they're watered down to a rather juvenile moral framework that doesn't actually explore the many facets of spirituality. Ones even tackled by the original series, such as the environmental devastation wrought by industrialized or even the idea of spiritual growth through personal development. So today we're going to talk about why the spirits of Avatar The Last Airbender worked so well and how Legend of Korra understood none of it. In Avatar, spirits are inherently linked to the natural world, be they embodiments of different aspects of nature or guardians of a specific forest or town, they're often directly involved whenever the natural world around them has been disrespected or threatened. They're not fully understood entities from another dimension. Rather, they're a sort of metaphorical abstract vessel for the world of Avatar itself. Spirituality is also seen as a way to understand oneself in relation to the rest of the world. General Iroh's enlightenment, his spiritual aptitude, is an extension of his ability to understand both himself and the ways of others, and the invisible connections between them. It is important to draw wisdom from many different places. Understanding others, the other elements, and the other nations will help you become whole. When Aang undergoes the process of unlocking his chakras, each one involves him confronting some kind of mental or emotional block. The trauma of having lost his people, the fear of hurting someone with his firebending, and the love he has for others. We are all one people, but we live as if divided. We're all connected. His spiritual growth is his personal growth. It's more than just, ooh, spooky ghost thingies must be respected. Likewise, spirits are not concerned with the concepts of good and evil or light and dark. They're beyond any kind of man-made construct. Spirits instead have specific motivations and causes. They have relationships with each other and the land that they're a part of. As such, they act directly in response to those things being jeopardized. In order to calm them, you must understand what caused them to wreak havoc if they can be calmed at all. Take Heibai, for instance. When the forest his statue is in is raised by the Fire Nation, he goes on a rampage, attacking any humans in the nearby village as retribution. You are the spirit of this forest. Now I understand. You're upset and angry because your home was burned down. He doesn't care that they're Earth Kingdom citizens, because to spirits, the lines between nations are imaginary ones useful only to humans. Likewise, we don't see where those he takes are whisked off to. They aren't killed or thrown in some spirit prison, but they simply vanish from existence. To appease Heibai, Aang has to understand why he is rampaging to begin with. Once he discovers the link between Heibai and the destroyed forest, he realizes that the Fire Nation's actions have ruined the spirit's home. To appease Heibai, Aang shows it the acorn that Katara showed him earlier, using it as a symbol of hope that the forest will one day grow back. When I saw the forest had burned, I was sad and upset. But my friend gave me hope that the forest would grow back. This does in fact appease Heibai. He returns to his pacified form and then leaves, releasing his captives through a bamboo thicket that grows in his place as he disappears mysteriously into the night. Then there's the Painted Lady, the spirit of the Zhanghui River in the Fire Nation. The Painted Lady? She's part of our town's lore. They say she's a river spirit who watches over our town in times of need. She was believed to once watch over a small fishing village on the river. However, the industrialization of the Fire Nation has led to pollution of its own environment, with one of its factories heavily contaminating the Zhanghui River and bringing illness upon the village. So we're a fishing town. At least that's how it was before the factory moved in. Army makes their metal there. Moved in a few years ago and started gunking up our river. And now our little village is struggling to survive. It's believed that this drove the Painted Lady away as well. 
Rather than seek retribution, she is seemingly vacated altogether. But when Katara masquerades as the Painted Lady to protect the village, heal its people, destroy the factory, and inspire the locals to clean the river, the Painted Lady directly visits and thanks her. She doesn't act the same way that Heibai did at all. As such, we can assume each spirit will act according to its own nature and personality. Tui and La, the moon and ocean spirits respectively, came to the human world long ago in the form of black and white koi fish. Tui and La, your moon and ocean, have always circled each other in an eternal dance. They balance each other, push and pull, life and death, good and evil, yin. And young. They swim in the spirit oasis of the Northern Water Tribe Palace, the original water tribe where we can assume the first waterbenders built their home. The legends say the moon was the first waterbender. Our ancestors saw how it pushed and pulled the tides and learned how to do it themselves. When Zhao kills the moon spirit, the ocean spirit joins with Aang in his avatar state to seek vengeance upon the Fire Nation army. They assume a terrifying form, which the waterbenders immediately recognize and bow to while the ocean spirit decks the Fire Nation invaders. It's only when Princess Yue assumes the role of the new moon spirit that the ocean spirit ends its rampage and returns to the koi pond. Through all of this, neither spirit speaks at all save for Yue as the moon spirit. Instead, we understand their motivations through what we're told by Ko, and by the clear connection between the two as a stand-in for Yin and Yang. Uh, remember that bit for later. Then we have the freakier spirits. Firstly, Ko the Face Stealer, who lives within his own domain in the spirit world. A spooky, gnarled tree surrounded by a thick fog and a petrified forest. We don't know exactly why or how, but Ko is not very fond of humans. Well, except for their faces. When he encounters one or any living thing, he waits for them to express even the slightest hint of emotion. Once they do, he steals their face to wear for himself leaving his victim a faceless husk. When you speak with him, you must be very careful to show no emotion at all, not the slightest expression, or he will steal your face. He is rather mysterious. Again, we don't know why exactly he does this, though we do know that he isn't fond of Avatar Korok in particular, having stolen the face of his lover. How could I forget you? One of your previous incarnations tried to slay me. Oh, it was something about stealing the face of someone you loved. It gets further explained in the comics, but it's honestly much more interesting leaving so much of Ko's nature as a mystery. It adds to the frightening power of his presence, even his form as this giant centipede lurking within the darkness of a hollowed tree inspires sheer terror as he coils around Aang. He does provide useful information that helps Aang, giving insight into the nature of the moon and ocean spirits and their corporeal forms. He could have easily lied if he were indeed truly evil, but he doesn't. He tells the truth, and though he does try to seize an opportunity to steal Aang's face when he expresses excitement, even trying to scare him at points, Ko accepts when Aang manages to go back to a neutral expression and leaves. If anything, Ko is more mischievous and a little bit petty than he is outright evil. Wan Shi Tong, he who knows 10,000 things, has an insatiable curiosity. He longs to collect all the knowledge of the universe and gather it within his library thanks to his foxy knowledge seekers. He believes in knowledge for knowledge's sake. He's also not very fond of humans, because in his experience, humans abuse that knowledge to outwit and destroy each other. Humans only bother learning things to get the edge on other humans. Like that firebender who came to this place a few years ago, looking to destroy his enemy. It is a corruption of what Wan Shitong loves. He doesn't care about the different sides in a human war, seeing it as little more than another repetition in humankind's long and fraught history. You think you're the first person to believe their war was justified? Countless others before you have come here seeking weapons or weaknesses or battle strategies. Throughout the entire show, spirits are not really depicted as light or dark, good or evil. They simply are. Some may be more cruel than others, but they don't quite adhere to a human understanding of morality. And how could they? Even the constructs of morality are rather young compared to the timelessness of spirits. It's like trying to ask whether a hurricane or a blizzard is good or evil. 
The weather is not good or evil, it simply is, and spirits are very much the same. Except with a bit more attitude. I'll delve into this a bit later, but it basically boils down to the difference between immoral and amoral. Human morality is a construct that varies wildly between regions, cultures, religions, time periods, and even individual people. What is considered good or evil, or even good or bad, yes those are different, depends on all of these different factors. To be evil would be going against morality, and thus immoral. Amorality, however, is the objection of this system altogether. To be amoral is not to be good or bad, evil or good, but rather to not operate within this framework to begin with. Spirits are neither good or evil, but rather amoral, acting outside of any kind of moral framework. But Legend of Korra... It doesn't quite view spirits this way. I really do appreciate that Legend of Korra wanted to explore spirits more in depth. They were such a fascinating part of Avatar's world, it makes perfect sense that its sequel series would want to do a bit more with them. However, it does so without understanding what made the spirits of Avatar unique or interesting, and instead tries to explain the spirits, the rules around them, and their world logically and according to human understanding. And by doing so, they rob the spirits of their air of mystery, their mysticism, their inherent connection to the natural world, and their indifference to human ideas of morality. Spirits first begin appearing naturally in Book 2, Spirits. In the original series, spirits were incredibly distinct, largely due to their rarity. They could appear as humans, as animals, as unique chimeric creatures based on different animals, or as something completely different and alien altogether. But because spirits are so ubiquitous in Korra, it resulted in a need to simplify the design of the quote-unquote average spirit. They needed common ones that could just easily be thrown into a scene without the need to give them unique designs. And thus, you get colored paint blobs just flying around everywhere. Spirit, why are you angry with us? What have we done to offend you? There's no real character or personality to these gooey globs. They're more akin to generic energy monsters or Studio Ghibli extras than the otherworldly entities or characters of the original series. The closest you get are the Gophers Korra and Jinora encounter when they first enter the spirit world, angered by Korra inadvertently disturbing their home and then trying to bend at them. Get out of my world! Get away from me! Ugh. She tried to bend at us! in our own holes! Some are interesting, like the sunbird that Korra befriends, but without any clear motivation like hey bye, these spirits feel incredibly superfluous, just like the paint blobs. With the world of Korra becoming heavily industrialized, it should be easy to see why the spirits would have become so irate, as their homes are destroyed, turned into human cities and stripped of their resources, they would naturally become infuriated and lash out, and that metaphorically speaks to the spiritual decay of a rapidly industrializing world. Even the very concept of modernity is informed by, in our world, colonialist attitudes, and it's the same in the Avatar world. The Fire Nation's industrialization both allowed and prompted them to invade and colonize the other nations, to impose their idea of progress on the rest of the world, to take their resources to fuel their machines, and to eradicate other cultures and ways of life seen as primitive and inferior. But None of that is really part of Book 2's conversation about spirituality. For more about this topic regarding colonialism's lasting effects, I recommend Kay and Skittles' video about the politics of Legend of Korra's Book 2. But through all of Book 2, the story only pays lip service to this idea of industrialization and, by extension, colonization leading to spiritual decay, and even taking the very concept of modernity for granted without investigating where it comes from. It is all instead boiled down to a very black and white battle of tradition versus progress, and even worse, a battle between... Ugh, good and evil. Since the beginning of time, we have battled over the fate of this world. Ew! What I honestly hate most about the spirits in Korra is the introduction of light and dark spirits. As per usual, the light equals good and dark equals bad. When spirits are, quote unquote, 
out of balance, the darkness takes over, literally giving them a very obviously evil form and forcing them to go on a rampage. There are no evil spirits. There is light and dark in them all. But when they're unbalanced, the darkness takes over. Instead of the spirits being amoral, existing outside of moral frameworks of any kind, Legend of Korra tries to instead to shoehorn spirits into a very basic Western good and evil framework with this light and dark system, in which light is the fave, obviously. Take Heibai, for instance. When he was rampaging, it wasn't because he became a dark spirit. The destruction of the forest didn't turn him evil. Instead, he was just genuinely in pain and lashed out at any humans in his path. He was amoral. If this happened in Korra, Heibai's design and writing would have made him come off as immoral and 25% more generic, turned dark because he was out of balance. And instead of appeasing him by giving him hope of the forest growing back through the acorn one day, Korra would have just waterbended the evil out of him. Nope, no longer do spirits need a specific reason or a motivation to be upset, nor do they need a unique response to the situation. And no longer do you need to understand their pain and ameliorate it to help them. Instead, you can just clearly identify them as a dark, corrupted spirit and then waterbend some swirlies around them to make them go take a nap. Who needs compassion in an honest effort to bridge divides when you can instead hit the purify button? Perhaps the worst example of the show's need to force spirits into a moral framework is the classic good and evil duo Rava and Vatu, aka God Kite and Satan Kite. He is the force of darkness and chaos. I am the force of light and peace. Aesthetically, they do resemble the yin and yang symbol, something Tween Law already fulfilled, grumble grumble, but philosophically, they are a complete misunderstanding of the concept. Yin and yang are not good and evil. They are the relation between two opposing forces which exist in perpetuity, order and chaos, masculine and feminine, passive and active. The symbol is meant to represent how the two constantly flow around one another, always harmoniously coexisting. In fact, when one overpowers the other, the imbalance always causes problems. Too much yin is as bad as too much yang. Rava and Vatu, by stark contrast, do not coexist harmoniously. Instead of dancing around each other, they battle constantly for control. Since the beginning of time, we have battled over the fate of this world. One always seeks to dominate the other. That's about as far away from yin and yang as you can get. And yes, Rava, or in this case, yin, having dominance is as much a bad thing as Vatu being loose. But instead, Rava is portrayed as light and good, meaning we're supposed to want her to overpower Vatu's darkness and evil. It is a projection of Western moral frameworks on a completely amoral concept. Legend of Korra is not alone here. Most Western media takes this framework of good and evil for granted, given it's the system that we have all lived in and had ingrained in us since birth. But what makes it sting especially is how it completely fails the amoral spectacle of the original series. Not to mention I'm just annoyed by, once again, the lip service to balance. He cannot destroy light any more than I can destroy darkness. One cannot exist without the other. But then the goal is not to have Rava and Vatu coexisting in the Avatar in harmony, which would actually embody the concept of yin and yang. Instead, the goal is to lock Yang inside of a tree for 10,000 years because apparently Yang is Satan. This is your prison now, and I will close the portal so no human will ever be able to physically enter the spirit world and release you. Yin dominates the world, and apparently that imbalance is a good thing because the right side won. One cannot exist without the other. This robs the world of the rich complexity and mystery of spirits. Not to mention, it also takes away the complexity of Unalak as an antagonist. Legend of Korra loves to paint its villains as always having a point, but just going too far in their ambitions. The problem was those guys were totally out of balance and they took their ideologies too far. And in Unalak's case, it's... Well, it's actually kind of hard to decipher. He claims to want to give the world back to the spirits and return to a world which had more reverence for them. You think what Avatar wanted was good? Driving almost all the spirits from this world? In the original series, that would have likely made him want to 
disrupt industrialization. But again, Legend of Korra doesn't really seem interested in the connections between spirituality, industrialization, modernity, and colonization. So we're kind of already starting on very shaky ground. This is made worse by the fact that Unalak himself is written as a deceitful, manipulative character who seems to derive pleasure in tormenting his enemies and even disregards the well-being of his own children. You're no brother of mine. You betrayed me. You had me banished. Yes, I did. Any kind of virtue or goal that he claims to have for the spirits doesn't come across as sincere, but as a facade for his evil ambitions. And they took their ideologies too far. He didn't go too far. He was just a fucking liar. He's a cartoonish villain amplified by his loyalty to Satan Kite. 10,000 years of darkness begins. There are no evil spirits. Because Vatu is depicted as inherently evil and must be stopped, it makes any attempt to liberate him come across as evil for the sake of of evil. It robs the story of any nuance, devolving it into a conflict not about the clashing motivations of characters and their opposing values, but the literal forces of good and evil shooting light and dark energy beams at each other. It's not like the evil of human characters like Sozin, Azulon, and Ozai. Each of them were imperialist tyrants with their own motivations. Sozin deluded himself into wanting to spread his idea of prosperity and was partially driven by spite towards Roku. We should share this prosperity with the rest of the world. In our hands is the most successful empire in history. It's time we expanded it. Azulon, from what we've seen, appeared largely cold and detached focused solely on expanding the empire from a very dispassionate view. And Ozai was a cruel, sadistic bastard fueled by ego. The through line for all of them was the Fire Nation ethos of self-righteous superiority, a belief that might makes right. You're weak, just like the rest of your people. They did not deserve to exist in this world, in my world and even a desire to conquer the natural world. Why else would they oppose the Avatar and the spirits themselves? Though they are clearly evil within a moral framework, there's still a reason for their evil that they justify in their heads. Unalak and Vatu, by comparison, are just evil for evil's sake. They're not fueled by human desires or delusions of grandeur, or at least Vatu definitely isn't, and his very involvement and existence cloud any insight into Unalak's goal. And even when the spirit portals are opened, the idea of spirits coexisting with humans is never really explored sufficiently. We don't see people become more spiritually developed in tune with the natural world. Instead, we get commercialized vines that we organize tour groups around and also, new airbenders? Literally, nothing even changed aside from having a few ghosties floating around. People don't become more appreciative or respectful towards the natural world. They don't become more in tune with themselves or spiritually balanced, reconnecting with the elements and their philosophies. Instead, just going about their industrialized, modernized lives as huge, but with a greenwashed filter. Oh, also, I just want to say that I hate the introduction of literal spirit portals. This literalization takes away from any metaphorical strength of the spirits, instead of making them seem like ordinary creatures who happen to be from another dimension. It misses the understanding of spirits from a narrative perspective as an extension of the natural world. It feels less like an attempt to build upon the metaphors of spirits and more like the creators wanted to take away the mystery factor of spirits for the sake of substituting story and theme with lore for lore's sake. Lore is not a story. You can communicate lore as a story, Lord of the Rings style, but lore in and of itself is not a story even if you can put it on a goddamn wiki page. Legend of Korra really dropped the ball when it comes to spirituality. It had every chance to interrogate the fraught relationship between spirituality and an ever-modernizing world, exploring the nuance of how a world scarred by war and colonization could spiritually heal. What we got instead was a basic run-of-the-mill good versus evil story projected onto the world of Avatar, losing everything that made both spirits and the concept of spirituality in the original series so compelling and mature. Anyhow, if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more content like this from me, then you can subscribe and ring that bell for notifications because YouTube hates creators. If you would like to support me and the channel further, then you can pledge your support over on Patreon and check out my urban fantasy novel, Disinerbus from the Ashes, wherever books are sold. I'm the Unicorn of War, 
And the era of Rob is a shit show. 